Should we start with the um, the minutes from last month? Yep. Yep. Okay, so I guess I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to motion approve. approve. Second. 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 Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? I might abstain because I was not present for most of that meeting at a conflict. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda. Do we have our guests with us? We do. It also, we have some folks on from the public. So uh, I don't oh, know if we I'm want sorry. to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we want to do a round of introductions of the CAC members and then the members of the public? I think it's just Kent. Um, so I know we, oh. I think we've done introductions together before, but Kent, if you have any public comments or if anyone else that I've missed. Um... The only public comment that I have is that I'm very thankful that Gianna's on the agenda tonight. I wasn't able to, uh, uh, to go to the summit meeting in April. I, I serve on three of the basin water quality councils. And um, so I really felt bad that I couldn't go to the meeting and I'm so happy that she's here tonight and I get a chance to get caught up. So thanks for letting me attend tonight. Of course, always welcome Kent, <laughs> anytime. All right, is Jen the first on our agenda? Uh, Gianna, anybody... yep. Okay, is anybody else from the public um, on or is that it? There is a name that I don't recognize, um, Colleen Miller. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I work with Gianna, so I okay. was just sitting in on this. Thanks. Great. Welcome. Welcome. All right, then I think we can um, start the presentation. Unless anybody has anything else. Should I? Yep, you're good. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Let me take a minute to figure out screen share um, as usual. It takes me a second with Zoom. <clears throat> so I think I can do this and then this do you see my my first page yes yes, yes we can. okay fantastic thank you for that um so hi everyone thanks for having me join you all this evening my name is gianna petito my pronouns are she her and I am the grant supervisor for the Clean Water Initiative Program. And I am here this evening to chat with you uh, kind of broadly about the Clean Water Board and, and budget and maybe meander a little bit into um, the Clean Water Initiative Program and some of the things we're funding. Um, Kent, we certainly missed you at the summit. I apologize, this won't really be an update on the summit and what materials were there, but I'm happy to follow up with you later about some of the resources to read about key findings from, from that piece of the... Um, from that particular presentation or, or event. So it's not moving forward. Let's see, why not? Okay, great. So this is the presentation outline for today. I'll give a brief history of the Clean Water Board and Vermont's commitments to clean water for anyone that was um, that is new or unfamiliar with that, give you some updates about what came out of the state fiscal year 25 clean water budget and also some happenings with the board. Um, and then dive into a little bit of the clean water budget line items to grow some familiarity with this group and some of our longstanding line items, wrap up with clean water reporting and key takeaways and where to learn more. So starting with the history of the Clean Water Board and Vermont's commitments to clean water, there are two foundational pieces of legislation that really support how the state is approaching our funding for clean water. Um, and this group is likely very, very well aware of both of these. 
as well as the fact that one of the main drivers for both of these pieces of legislation is the Lake Champlain total maximum daily load. The fact that we are relying so much on pollutant reduction from non-point sources across the Lake Champlain Basin means we need to assure EPA that we really will achieve those reductions, and we assure EPA through strong policy and regulation and commitments of funding. So Act 64 of 2015, among many other things, launched the Clean Water Board and the Clean Water Fund. And then building on that, Act 76 of 2019 sort of refined and explained what the Clean Water Initiative is and stated an actual state commitment of 50 to $60 million a year, adjusted for inflation, to support all of the initiative's goals. It also added a new revenue source for the Clean Water Fund, which together with its other revenue sources now made the fund feel sufficient and long-standing enough to support our state's clean water goals. It reset what the board should prioritize and how they allocate their budget. And it launched four new grant programs, including the Water Quality Restoration Formula Grants for clean water service providers, the Water Quality Enhancement Grants, municipal stormwater grants. And these are really large granting initiatives that have really sort of restructured how we are now administering a large portion of funds coming out of the clean water budget. So to take a step back and say, what do we mean by these words, clean water initiative, clean water board, clean water budget? So the initiative again was sort of refined and defined in statute out of Act 76. So this is an interagency initiative that's gonna provide the mechanism staffing and financing to, to make sure that we as a state can maintain compliance with our water quality standards. To reach these goals, we're gonna fund, we're gonna commit 50 to $60 million a year. And this Venn diagram hopefully helps you all see where the board and budget sit within the initiative. So they are not, they're not the same thing as the initiative, but the money that flows through the clean water budgeting process are a huge part and parcel of what we see as the state commitments towards make, making that 50 to $60 million target. That target, by the way, came out of a 2017 Treasury report between Act 64 and Act 76. Um, the legislature asked this, the um, Treasurer to say, how much do we actually need to sort of sufficiently long-term fund our clean water goals? The target that ultimately came out of that was about 50 to 60 million. But as you can see in this Venn diagram, we also um, contribute money through appropriation bill. For example, the Department of Fish and Wildlife's watershed grants, those have those um, contribute to clean water goals, but aren't allocated via the clean water budget process. So the Clean Water Fund, again, launched in statute. It's to assist with the implementation of the Clean Water Initiative, but is not the only funding source that supports it. The role of the board, though, is to make the recommendations of expenditure out of this fund. And then there are three key sources into this fund, which is the unclaimed um, beverage container deposits, the property transfer tax, clean water surcharge, and the 6% meals and room tax. Collectively, that um, gets about $25 million a year in revenue on an average year. The clean water budget, in contrast, is sort of like all the dollars that the Clean Water Board um, makes recommendation on every year. So in statute, the board also makes a recommendation on some capital bill money, um, as well as in state fiscal years 22, 23, and 24, they made recommendations on American Rescue Plan Act money, which you can see um, with the red hash lines on this bar chart. So collectively, the budget, as you've seen over time, has grown up until 2024, where it hit just over $50 million. And then this year, 20, this fiscal year, which starts in July, the budget dropped significantly down to 39589 39 million, um, largely due to sort of the loss of ARPA, which was expected, but also a slight decrease in the what was expected to come out of the clean water section of the capital bill. We're expecting this will roughly level out, though, after state fiscal year 2026. The Clean Water Board has a very um, predictable annual budgeting cycle. Um, so the board is, are all the important people sitting around this table. They are um, the secretaries of five different state agencies and four members of the public appointed by the governor. And so they receive a draft budget that uh, is comprised of what the state projects will come in from the Clean Water Fund revenue, all those tax sources, as well as what's expected to come from the capital bill and from the Clean Water section of the capital bill. The board considers that draft um, budget, sends it out for public comment, receives public comment, responds to public comment, and then sends over a proposal to the governor. 
the governor integrates the recommendation into the full budget proposal and then in January makes the budget address for the full state budget. The legislature considers the full budget over the legislative session. And then um, once approved, hopefully in May, um, then the following the next July, a couple months later is the start of the fiscal year, agencies receive spending authority and can start to encumber and spend those dollars. Um, there is, um, as we mentioned, a public comment process. The Clean Water Initiative Program provides the staff support to the board to facilitate this process. And so this is a slide from last year's public comment process period about all the ways the public can participate and provide input on the budget. And we are always looking for great partners to help spread the word when the annual budgeting cycle is, is coming up um, to see how much more um, public comment we can get on the, on the budget. So that's a brief overview. Um, and please feel free to interrupt me at any point if, if folks have any clarifying questions, but I'm going to dive now into some highlights for state fiscal year 2025, both on the budget and some um, happenings or action taken by the board. And I, uh, I apologize that this is really a small <laughs> zoomed out version of the budget. Um, there's, a, I don't know if you can click directly on these links through Zoom. I don't think you can, but I'm going to share this slide deck later. Um, with Katie, and hopefully you can access this if you're interested. This is the state fiscal year 25 budget as recommended by the board. I don't think there were any changes as past, like as of last week, but I have to check. Um, and then down in this corner, you can access any other fiscal year budget should you be interested. But big picture, the budget um, tends to have ongoing sets of line items that don't change from year to year. Um, they tend to be longstanding initiatives. Act 76 did sort of reprioritize how the board should allocate funds. So since that started getting integrated into the budget in state fiscal year 23, this is now the third year, the whole budget has been organized by these priority tiers. And so essentially this piece of statute says, you know, as first priority, the board should fund yada, yada, yada. As second priority, they should fund yada, yada, yada. Um, and so that got interpreted into these tiers and any spending lines that kind of relate or meet that goal fit into that tier. And the board has um, interpreted priority to be sort of volume of funding. So they aim every year to give about 60% of the funds to tier one, 30% to tier two, and then 10% to tier three or other priorities. Other priorities aren't explicitly listed in this piece of statute, but might've been listed elsewhere like lakes and crisis or other priorities that can best, that the Clean Water Fund can help best leverage um, in federal dollars. This year for Safe Fiscal Year 25, there's, um, there's a lot more going into tier one. There's about 70% of the full budget and 80% specifically of the Clean Water Fund that are all going into tier one. There's some other line item things to draw your attention to. This, um, this is sort of one-time funding over here. The green is base funding. There was a lot of one-time funding that this, the board had for reasons I won't dive into, but um, there is some one-time funding this year going to support potentially flood recovery needs. We're pending some um, input from partners on a flood uh, response verification tool that we deployed last summer and should that need um, come back to us, we might be using some of the money to support flood recovery needs. There's a million in there to support reassessments of road erosion inventories. So the this is under tier two. Tier two includes municipal stormwater implementation grants, which by statute support municipalities in meeting any of their regulatory stormwater obligations, including um, road compliance under the municipal roads general permit. Those standards got updated recently, and so this funding is to support reassessing the roads to, to see whether they meet the new standards. There's also some one-time funding under the innovative and alternative line item that um, supports uh, potential alum treatment in Lake Carmi pending the results of a um, feasibility study and permitting. There's also a, a, a tool that the board uses for risk management called the contingency reserve. So if um, for folks who are unaware, the Clean Water Fund, again, collects tax revenue from these three different sources. And when we build a budget, we're actually projecting what the revenue will be for the same fiscal year we're going to spend that money. So this state fiscal year 24, we're running on a budget based on what we think will come in by the end of this June. Come this June, if we find out that the Clean Water Fund revenue is not as much as we expected, 
all the um, agencies will have potentially already encumbered into contracts or spent some of that money. So rather than having to, to rebudget, issue a rebudgeting process, or have to um, redo contracts, the contingency reserve is used to tap into to support making sure that we can make whole our financial commitments. So that has existed for a while now. Um, you can access the Clean Water Fund contingency reserve guidelines at the link provided that kind of articulates how this gets accessed. But what's new this year in February is the board um, approved edits to the guidelines that allowed for additional use of this contingency reserve to support clean water project losses. So in the case that there's, um, say, unfortunately, another large flood and some of the um, investments over the last few years into clean water projects has been washed away, this, con this contingency reserve line is a potential source of funding to restore, repair the clean water project, or at least um, an equivalent amount of phosphorus. Yeah, I'll pause there. Uh, I see a question from Breck. Yeah, a really simple question. How large is that contingency reserve and is it sufficient? Yeah, it's. Um, it just recently got boosted up to 2.5 million. I think the goal in the guidelines is to aim for keeping it at roughly 10% of the full budget. Is it sufficient is a great question. Um, the, uh, I don't know if we know that if we've had enough years where it's not been COVID or flooding or et cetera to, there's just been so much change in the clean water budget as a whole. If I flip back to that first slide, you can see, you know, it started in 2016, there's a huge ramp up. Now there's a drop. We don't really know where we're going to sit in terms of long-term predictability of the clean water fund in general. And then now expanding it to this potential additional use, It'll be interesting to see how um, whether that remains whether that is sufficient to cover those needs. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Great question. Okay, so I, I've covered have, the history um, of the budget I board. I've question. covered. Uh, I'm sorry. Was Pardon. there another question? Yeah, it's Representative Carol. Oh, yeah. Hi. It's hi. So, um, Senator Brock, are you on finance, Senate Finance? Well, anyway, the, the clean water funding, what where I see it um, facing risks is in the House Ways and Means and in um, probably Senate Finance, not because those committees don't want to help, but because we sometimes get a bill from somewhere else that maybe it doesn't have the full enough for the full funding. So we really worked hard on that in my committee and I think in the Senate. But uh, my question is, do you, um, do you, can you um, like flag when, when there's an issue that you see an issue, are you allowed to do that and contact us? Or do we have to just keep doing this by paying strict attention? Because I just don't want to miss anything going forward. Well, I am on finance and yes, we can do anything we want to. Uh, but as a practical matter, when we look at a bill that originates elsewhere, uh, we look at solely at the finance aspect, not so much at the policy aspect of the bill. But if I know that there's a bill coming that relates to this, uh, I can certainly deal with the policy committees and, uh, and and then take it from there in terms of what we might might take a look at in finance. We typically wouldn't initiate, though, an action in finance. Right. And I just, I want to say that uh, I feel as though we've been protecting the Clean Water Fund and these other things in these committees. And I'm wondering if the person who's speaking right now, the one giving us this presentation. Um, yes. Hi, Gianna. <laughs> yes, Gianna, if you could, are, are you allowed to, you know, kind of let us know when those of us on that finance and on House Ways and Means, when something's coming up? I mean, we've caught the, we've caught it to date, but... Um, I just, I would like to have somebody, maybe you, Gianna, ping us when there's an issue. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm getting the gist of your question, Representative. There's, um, 
One of the things that we've been talking about sort of as staff support and in partnership with our colleagues over at the Agency of Administration is trying to um, provide to the legislature a bit more clarity about what the clean water budget is as proposed by the Clean Water Board. I think one of the things that does happen is when the governor integrates the recommendations, they sort of just get shuffled in and the legislature then sees the line items, but the clarity of what's kind of already gone through a cohesive public pro comment process and has been recommended by the, the board, um, that the, the weight of that sort of might get lost once it's sort of bundled into just all the different line items. So we've talked a little bit about how to, um, what are ways to maybe uh, shine a light on that, but we certainly still defer to the, you know, the legislative process in terms of you're, you all are taking the testimony and making those final decisions. And, and you know, um, I do believe that the, the Agency of Natural Resources keeps a close eye on the Clean Water Fund along with other things. And um, I, I do believe Secretary Moore has come in a few times and, and testified on certain items this year um, as it as it might have proposed using or tapping into the Clean Water Fund to support those, those new initiatives. So I do believe that there's, um, higher ups than I keeping track of those pieces and, and requesting testimony um, as needed. Does that answer your question? Well, it does for the, for knowing generally where we're supposed to be going, but I'm just hoping what I'd like to flag for you is when things are in Senate finance and in house ways and means things can, you know, there can be a loss of revenue very easily. Um, and so I just, uh, I want to, say that I, I would find it to be helpful if you all would please let us know what you think of the bills when they're in there in our Senate finance and in our House Ways and Means so we don't accidentally lose clean water funding. Okay, well, I think you. we could do it a little more affirmatively by simply as a committee asking uh, the, 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 the agency responsible for submitting that budget item uh, to earmark for us or to specifically indicate for us uh, what monies, if any, are directed towards the Clean Water Fund. So we I, don't miss it. I, yeah, I get it. I, for, that's for appropriations kind of. And now we've got like, percentages of this, that, or the other thing going to Clean Water Fund. And if, like, if we're not paying attention in those two committees, then we could easily lose significant percentages of those monies going forward so yeah, i would really would be because there, there isn't money allocated for it or there isn't a revenue source for what's in the bill generally speaking at least in the senate the appropriations committee really is the valve and typically in finance we defer to them to say how much money do they need in order to meet the resources that they've committed to and then our task is to raise the money mm -hmm. okay so typically we don't pull money out because we don't like it for one reason or another unless there's something more more, more than that. Should I move on? Does that, is that sufficient to move on? I would say yes. Okay. Okay, great, Thank great you. questions. Thank you. <clears throat> so I've talked a little about the history of the budget and also some um, updates for state fiscal year 25. And I now want to turn a little bit to for, um, gaining, helping you gain some familiarity with some of these budget line items, recognizing that some of them are pretty longstanding. Um, and so just helpful to maybe give you a really brief tour of, of what they are. So in the budget, you'll see the second column lists the agency or the department or program responsible for administering the funds. And so you'll notice yours truly and our DEC Clean Water Initiative Program or QIP is listed quite a bit throughout the clean water um, budget. So over the last two or three fiscal years, we've, we've received from the clean water budget 40 to 45% of the full budget to administer. So we do um, play a large role in moving these dollars and getting them on the ground. And so I wanted to just talk through these, these ones on, on the right of the slide, the Water Quality Restoration Formula Grant so that you're familiar with it. What we mean by statewide non-regulatory clean water projects, or um, we more often call this our enhancement grants, program and partner support line item, the municipal three acre general permit and MS4 and the developed lands implementation grant. So the ones that are asterisked 
here are the four new grant programs launched by Act 76. And the ones that are in orange, if you're savvy, will notice that the state fiscal year 25 clean water budget has um, zeroed these out. They do not have any new dollars for this coming fiscal year, but they are still um, standing and healthfully funded initiatives that I wanted to highlight for you all so you just have some awareness about what they are. So, so briefly, who is QUIP, the Clean Water Initiative Program? We're not the Clean Water Initiative. We're a standalone program. We're located in the Department of Environmental Conservation. We do, some of us provide staff support to the Clean Water Board and the Clean Water um, Initiative Interagency Group, um, but we are standalone. We receive other funding too, which I'll jump into for just in just a bit. And on the left, this circle represents the three pillars of our our mission statement, which includes developing those financial resources, which I understand is sort of developing those funding initiatives, getting those dollars on the ground. So here's a snapshot of our program's budget sources. You can see there's the clean water budget here um, with the green high or olive highlighted here. Um, you can see American Rescue Plan Act. Some of the money came to us by way of the clean water budgeting process, but a whole bunch of other ARPA money came to us directly by being allocated or appropriated to ANR and then um, directed to our program. We also, my colleague, Sarah Coleman, who's on this call that you're very familiar with, helps manage our EPA award that comes to us by way of the Lake Champlain Basin Program um, budgeting process. And some of our colleagues go out and recruit um, your federal funds and bring them into our program. For example, uh, tens of millions of dollars of USDA money to support agricultural clean water practices as well. So part of what we are doing when we're helping um, provide staff support to these budgeting is to talk about how these things can be complementary and not duplicative, and also packaging them into the funding programs to get the right stack of funding to the right places. So the red dots here, the red droplets kind of show examples of our funding programs and how they're funded across these different um, funding buckets. The geography of our funding programs, our main ones, um, there's a nice little uh, um, hand-drawn uh, graph on the left here. Um, so blue is where our MS4 community formula grant is available, obviously to the MS4 communities. Um, this is, uh, I'll talk about in a second just what that is, but it's in support of the Municipal Stormwater Implementations Grant, which is uh, a tier two initiative under Act 76. Purple highlights Lake Champlain and Lake Mem for Magog. And what's available here is all of our three acre regulatory assistance programs, as well as our formula grants or clean water service provider formula grants. And although the um, clean water service providers formula grants are due to expand statewide at some point. And then yellow is our um, water quality enhancement grants program is available statewide as is our clean water workforce capacity development block grant. So I'll, I'll run through these. Pardon me, I know I'm running a little over time here. Um, so the MS4 Community Formula Grant, again, that's about just shy of seven and a half million dollars. It did come to us by way of the clean water budget, but just for state fiscal years 23 and 24, it's a mix of ARPA and clean water funding. And we basically allocated via a formula to the 15 MS4s um, funding to do design or implementation of stormwater practices that have a phosphorus reduction component so that they could track that phosphorus reduction, make progress on their phosphorus control plans, and comply with their MS4 permit goals. The three acre regulatory assistance program, again, no money in the Clean Water Board, but healthfully funded over $50 million going into these initiatives, um, mostly through ARPA or the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And this is to support entities who um, are subject to the three acre permit after Act 64, um, over six, 700 sites in the state uh, may have to retrofit because they have three or more acres of impervious surface and don't necessarily have the stormwater controls to manage all that stormwater. And so we've, we have a whole bunch of initiatives to support different entities to either do the design work and get their permit or to also do the construction. I think this group may be most familiar with the Green Schools Initiative that supports public schools that are subject to this. We also have manufactured housing community programming as well as sort of a everyone's available can, re, can get a beneficiary program of up to $49,999. So this is a very brief run through, happy to talk about any of these at some point if you're interested. The Water Quality Restoration Formula Grants, again, that's another one created by Act 76. Um, it is focused on non-regulatory projects, clean water projects that have a phosphorus reduction benefit. Um, it is, uh, what is the formula? Well, this is a really great diagram that's sort of rough. 
basically every planning, major planning basin in Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog, um, our, our uh, knowledgeable colleagues went about estimating how much potential phosphorus reduction can come from non-regulatory work if we sort of assume the first part of our TMDL is met through regulatory reductions. And then what is that by sector? What is the potential by sector, ag, developed lands, forests, and streams? And then what is the estimated cost of reducing that phosphorus by sector? And let's multiply and add that all together. And this is a really rough version of how that formula works. But basically, that becomes a formula that we provide to that basin. And it's administered by a clean water service provider who receives the award and is um, in communication and consultation with the Basin Water Quality Council to then distribute those funds via contracts, via grants, um, to get good clean water projects done on the ground and make um, phosphorus progress, phosphorus reduction progress. Water quality enhancement grants were also part of Act 76, although we're um, just a brief paragraph summary. Um, again, focus on non-regulatory clean water projects to meet some goals, including protecting high quality waters, maintaining or improving water quality, supporting the public's use, et cetera, on the slide. So what DEC did is actually a year long um, stakeholder engagement process to figure out what, what should we do for enhancement grants to meet these goals? How can we design this program to, to meet your, your needs and predictability and stability at the same time? And what ended up happening is um, enhancement grants are now envisioned as sort of a series of sub initiatives that we manage. So we have a block grant for dam removals that we put out, someone else manages it, and then they individually fund a bunch of block, um, dam removal opportunities. We have a block grant for um, riparian water buff woody buffer projects. We have a, a couple of master contracts we hold for river corridor easement work. And then we have a large block grant for held by three different partners all statewide that funds project development, design and implementation of all different types of clean water projects across a whole bunch of sectors um, from stormwater to floodplains to ag projects and roads, et cetera. So basically enhancement grants became multiple grant programs um, after a consultation with groups. And then the last one to highlight, this is co-funded with Clean Water Fund and Lake Champlain Basin Program, EPA money, is a clean water workforce capacity development initiative. It's a pilot phase, we have $1 million out to a block grant holder or a funding program administrator. They just closed their granting round. They have a ton of requests in. We're really excited to start to dig into what applications came in through the door. But this is, um, this is many years in the making after multiple rounds of stakeholder engagement about what folks needed and how they needed it. It's a really um, flexible and unique design and how we're funding capacity. And so we're excited to see what comes out of that too. And I would be remiss not to close out with mentioning that we also do reporting. It's part of our, our mission statement to capture, assess, and communicate the progress of this work. So if you're not familiar with the Clean Water Initiative Performance Report, it's a really great resource that sort of summarizes the full Clean Water Initiative and some of the federal funding that helps us meet our TMDL progress in Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog. So it, it reports on stuff even beyond the Clean Water Initiative. It talks about all the investments and then um, what are the uh, outcomes of that and then the impact in terms of phosphorus reduction. It's re delivered to the legislature annually in January and um, access to it is on our website, which will be linked in the slide deck. So some key takeaways for folks who might be less familiar with the Clean Water Board that the Vermont has made a long-term commitment. It's in the range of roughly 50 to 60 million per year adjusted for inflation. The Clean Water Budget includes most often the Clean Water Fund and some contributions from the Clean Water section of the Capitol Bill. It is some but not all of the state's commitment um, to clean water goals. The scale of the clean water budget line items are at the initiative level. It's uh, the board doesn't make decisions on individual projects or individual practices. Um, the board does have an annual public process, um, public comment process and period, and we welcome any partnerships to help spread the word about this opportunity. The line items are multi-year spending initiatives. They fund multi-sector project types on clean water, um, both in regulatory, non-regulatory, different geographic areas, et cetera. And then many are also supported with funds outside the clean water budget. So sometimes looking at the clean water budget may not give the full story of the opportunity for clean water funding. Oh, I stopped sharing before I got to my last slide, which was where to learn more. But I'll have a slide that when I share the slide deck, it's got links to where to learn more if you're interested more about the clean water board, the budget, 
and the Clean Water Initiative program. So thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any other questions, but I know we're, we're over. Yes. Wayne. Thank you so much. That was a great, um, sorry, it's just, that was a great presentation, but is Wayne's hand up? Yeah. Go ahead, yes. Wayne. Yeah. Um, quick question on the funding. So just pick for an example, a MS4 community gets a project funding for construction of you know, stormwater treatment practice to address phosphorus. What are the deadlines of where they have to, how quickly do they have to spend those funds? Um, and if they don't spend those funds, does that go back into the budget? Is that reallocated somehow? Or how is that all tracked and managed? Great question, Wayne. It depends on the how the program is designed and the funding program, the fund source. So the MS4 formula grant that we manage is co-funded with Clean Water Fund and ARPA. Yeah. ARPA is federal money that does have a deadline. So yeah. um, they are they are strongly encouraged in their grant agreements to spend down their ARPA first. Yeah. Um, they're allowed to use Clean Water Fund though, because Clean Water Fund can help them leverage other dollars. They can use that as match. So there might be reasons why they don't spend the ARPA money first. Um, there's also potentially Lake Champlain Basin program money for MS4s to continue this progress um, via the SRF um, program. And those deadlines might be subject to LCBP funding and also the SRF program. So like when things have to get spent down is really subject to the program design and the funding source. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Breck. You're muted. Sorry. Is there a brief explanation for the difference between projects that are selected via the block grant process and those that are selected via the Clean Water Council process? The Clean Water Board, you mean? Uh, I thought the first, what was the first line item on your on your budget there that you were showing that had some of the, that had other information about the block grants? Can you ask your question again? I'm sorry, what was the first line of a certain slide? Yeah, it was the one that I think was the second to the last slide that had the uh, block grants on it. There's some examples of some of the block grants. Oh, enhancement grants. Okay. Yes. So what's the difference between our enhancement block grants and the... That, that first line on, on that budget, I thought that that was something with the Clean Water Council's done. Clean Water that? Service Providers and their Basin Water Service Quality Service Providers, sorry. Yeah, okay, great. I'm sorry. Thank you. Now no, I no, I, I misstated it. Sorry. No, great, great question. So, um, so both of those, the clean waters, um, the water quality formula grants to clean water service providers and enhancement grants are both administered by our program. We design most of our grants to be nowadays because of the volume to be what we call a block grant format where we kind of issue money out to someone else who then issues the money out. Kind of by default, the clean water service provider one also kind of operates like a block grant. So we really see those clean water service providers as another one of those block grant holders for us, where they work on our behalf to, you know, solicit project proposals and work with the Basin Water Quality Councils. They're also unique, though, because statute and rule and guidance for service providers is a lot more um, uh, specific about how they go about managing that grant program was for was for our enhancement grants and etc. It's a lot. Uh, it, we just point to a funding policy. It's a programmatic policy about what they need to uphold and follow. So there's a lot more restrictions about how they solicit projects and have the BWIC vote on the Basin Water Quality Council vote on those and meeting their targets, their phosphorus reduction targets. Uh, thanks. So my question was about how how those you know the the individual project selections are coordinated uh, to so that they're most effective. Um, it, is there any coordination or any need for coordination? There is a strong strong need for coordination between those grant programs, but also beyond those grant programs. You know, with our partners in the Basin Program, with the other agencies that have funding um, that also fund potentially non regulatory projects. Uh, the right now, our best level of coordination, so the clean water service providers meet collectively with DEC monthly to talk about issues and converse on that piece. All of our DEC-led funding program administrators meet 
mm, probably like biannually or quarterly is our goal to have those round tables to kind of converse. We strongly encourage them to talk with each other when they have project by project applications where they feel like one is a better fit. There's some um, grant requirements for the enhancement holders that if the project seems like a better fit for QUISPs, for clean water service providers, like it has a strong phosphorus reduction to send them that way. So there's, there's sort of written requirement in their respective guidance to, to pass applications to each other. But also the, the um, watershed planning program, the, the watershed planners are a really great resource. They're DEC staff and they, um, they are sort of a technical advisor to the Basin Water Quality Councils and are really in tune with all the projects that are going on that are funded by DEC and elsewise. So they can also help with sort of the traffic control or letting folks know like, hey, this partner kind of already applied for this project over here, this might be duplicative or, hey, this one's really needed. This is the last stop, like they already have this funding but there's this last stop gap that we really need. So thank, those thank are the you. flavors really of coordination. Yeah. Thank you, very helpful. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you so much for your for your time and the opportunity to chat with you all. And I am available. Uh, my contact information will be on this, these slides that I will share with Katie if if you have follow up questions. Thanks, Gianna. Um I'll have you send me uh, that presentation and I will include that with the meeting follow-up materials. Um, Eric, I think we're ready for your basin program update if you are. Sure, yes. Hi everyone, good to see you again. Um, uh, let's see, do I, how do I, there we go, share screen. Sure. All right, is that working? Sorry, I, I use Zoom so rarely now. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so Katie asked me to, to log in um, and uh, share a little bit about the, the Basin Program's federal fiscal year 2024 budget with you. Um, we just wrapped that up um, more or less uh last month with the the steering committee approval in in in, in april um this year i just realized i cut out my title slide so i don't get to give you the 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 big impact number but our total budget was uh just shy of 30 million 35 million dollars uh this year it was which was more or less um a level funding from the previous year um, I have a slide at the end that will show you a, a, a chart of uh, how our, our uh, funding has um, grown over the last uh, decade or so. Um, anyway, so the Basin Program budget, I think most of you by this point should be fairly familiar with, with uh, the layout and st or structure of our management plan, Opportunities for Action. Uh, we have four primary goals in the management plan, uh, clean water, healthy ecosystems, uh, thriving communities and an informed and involved public. And I structure the budget around those four goals. And then also a fifth, there's a fifth section in there called that I call key functions, which is like our base or operating uh, portion of the budget. So uh, I'm gonna, just gonna run through the, the, f the five sections of the budget with you. Um, and then uh, I can dive into a little bit more detail about, about uh, some, what's in some of the interesting some of the interesting programs that are supported in, in the budget. Uh, so the for the the first part of the budget, the key functions, which is where most of the staff are supported, office lights are support kept on, and and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we have uh, for a little over four and a half million dollars in uh, that budget. That's up from three point three from last year. That a lot of that is attributed to increasing staff costs and and everything else that's happening out there in the world that makes things a lot more expensive. Um, uh, so then other, uh, that all, this uh, part of the budget also includes three new staff positions, uh, one in the clean, as part of the clean water team working with Matt and May Kate, for those of you who know uh, them, and then two new administrative uh, positions, one um, doing um, 
uh, helping with client management and office management work. And then a third one that is going to be connected to uh, reporting of uh, metrics. Um, and this is, you'll see at the bottom of this, the last bullet on the slide, slide here is metrics reporting. Um, and so we have, we're, we're um, investing a significant amount of money into uh, collecting information about uh, uh, about all of our different grants that we support and the programs that we that we support as well, um, like the number of full time positions that are supported, the number of uh, students in various forms, undergraduate right on through through postdocs, um, and then uh, match and volunteer hours and time and things like that, and then uh, and that's generally and then uh, within each of the different grant categories, it'll be things like pounds of phosphorus removed or acres of stormwater or impervious surface area treated or or uh, acres of riparian habitat that are planted with trees and, and things like that. Um, and this position will will help us to collect if all of that information efficiently and then push it back out to groups like the Citizen Advisory Committee and our congressional delegation and, and other stakeholder groups to help uh, report out on what we're doing with all the, the federal funding that we receive. Um, uh, a couple of other uh, line items items in this, in this part of the budget. Uh, we're supporting. We have support for another research symposium. It's that time again. We support uh, this uh, research symposium every three or four years. And so right now, um, we are working with uh, folks from the Lake Champlain Research Consortium, which is a collaboration uh, of of uh, many of the academic institutions that are based here in the Champlain Basin. Um, that do water quality related or Lake Champlain related work um, and Lake Champlain Sea Grant. And um, I need to get together with them and figure out when we want to hold it, but it'll be uh, sometime um, not within the next year. I can tell you that um, uh, probably at least as, as uh, if it, at, at the earliest, it would be actually May, end of May next year, um, more likely um, spring of uh, 2026. Um, and that's a really interesting opportunity when we do hold it. I'd encourage those of you who are able to attend to do so. It's it's a really neat play, uh, opportunity to, to just learn about all the different work that's supported and happening or in and around Lake Champlain across the whole spectrum of, of management for the lake. Um, another one that's in here is, is around pre and post flood response sampling. This is a, um, a task that we, this task addresses uh, or will address a uh, gap in our knowledge, I guess I'll, I'll call it, um, that we learned that we that came to light last July when we had all the flooding happening, particularly in the Vermont side of the basin, and um, we were we and many of our partners were just inundated. I'm not going to use flooded, inundated with questions um, about whether or not it was safe to swim in the lake, um, and we couldn't answer it. We just didn't. We didn't know if, if you know, the, the, we could. Do, we were folks. Were, some people were doing some some um, bacteria sampling, and 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 um, it was kind of off and on, and not really well organized and coordinated. Um, and there was a lot of other questions around, like public health related questions, not necessarily water quality questions, which we are tooled up well to to do and answer those types of questions. Um, so this is an this is a program that we're going to develop over the next year or so. Um, Matt Vaughn and our chief scientist is taking the lead on it. And uh, it will this, this task will allow us to uh, support some um, ad hoc sampling uh, for for uh, public health related parameters like bacteria E. coli bacteria sampling and, and probably a few other things. Um, uh, that will allow us to answer the questions from from the general public when, if and when a flood comes up again, um, and so we're developing the the protocols and all that for that all all that kind of stuff for the program now, and hope to have it ready to go for for next summer. Oh, whoops, I didn't mean to advance that, but all right, <clears throat> move on. Um, so the other elements of the of the budget we have the heritage area. I think many of you are familiar with the the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership. Um, if not, be happy to bring in Jim Brangen at some point and chat with, share more with you about the heritage area here in the Champlain Valley. Um, that 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 program will be supported at uh, will, ha will have grant funding available, a little shy of five hundred thousand um, dollars. That's uh, supported with National Park Service funding, and then our other our four OFA goals. Um, you can see there we'll have. Uh, 
$12.8 million in clean water, $11 million in healthy ecosystems, uh, thriving communities will be around a little over $3.3 million, and informed and involved public uh, is at $2.3 million. Um, the last slide here that I promise to show you is uh, just a chart, a figure of how our funding has uh, grown, uh, again, over the past decade or so. Um, so you can see actually from a low point uh, 10 years ago in 2014, where our this is federal appropriations, EPA, uh, National Park Service, Great Lakes Fishery Commission are our primary three primary federal uh, funding sources, and then a few others as well. Um, so in 2014, our, our, our budget that the steering committee had to work with was um, just about, just just around between three and a half and four million dollars. In 2024, ten years later, we're just shy of of 35 million dollars. So that's how much we've grown in the last in the last ten years. Um, that's uh, a lot of that is courtesy of Senator Leahy, um, and and his role in, as either chair or vice chair of the Senate, Senate Appropriations Committee, and then our congressional delegation now has been able to carry that momentum forward and keep us level funded for the past. Um, two fiscal years, and uh, they're working to do the same for FY25 once Congress really gets there, gets into that that pro part of the process. Um, how do I stop sharing? There we go. Uh, so I don't have any more slides, but I can also, if folks would like, I know you are you have some time to, um, uh, you're running out of time on the agenda here, but I can also just dive into the details of the budget. Um, share some of the highlights of the programs with you. Um, we are, uh, for the, the um, heritage area, we, we are uh, supporting a, a number of grants that are uh, interpreting and commemorating the semi-quincentennial of the American Revolution, which is, for those of you who are not up on your vernacular, that is the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. That will be uh, ramping up starting uh, next year and running for the next three years after that. Uh, so a number of grants grants around that that effort um, and interpretation. In the clean water program, we'll have one and a half million dollars uh, set aside for our, our typical clean water implementation grants. Another million dollars for uh, research re related projects. I cannot. I know Breck, you want to know what we're funding for research. Um, we I, we haven't we haven't announced those awards yet, so I uh, can't get into those details just yet. But maybe uh, a future meeting, I can we can share that information. Um, where was I? And then uh, for the Vermont TMDL funding, this is this was eight million dollars this year. This is um, correct co congressionally directed. Uh, within our Section 120 authorization, so not like earmark money, it's actually written into the appropriations bill more or less every year now as funding to be directed to implement the, the Vermont TMDL. Um, and uh, Sarah Coleman can share more details with on these programs with you if she hasn't already on the, the Green Schools Initiative and Stormwater Design Program, um, their Wetland Acquisition Program, and also the the uh, Ag uh, Practice Implementation Program. Um, there'd be $4 million for the screen schools and then $2 million each for the wetland acquisition and enhanced agricultural practice implementation program. Uh, and healthy ecosystems. Uh, we also have another million dollars in research related projects uh, through that through that uh, part of the uh, management plan through, health, through that goal. Uh, we are supporting a year two of an AIS aquatic invasive species personnel position that is placed at DE, Vermont DEC. Um, so flag to uh, those of you who are in the legislature and are sitting on uh, the relevant finance and, and appropriations committees. Uh, the Basin Program Steering Committee has agreed to support this very important invasive species position for three years. Um, so this is the second year. Um, and then uh, Beyond that, it will be uh, the responsibility of the state to continue that position if they, they feel it's important. Um, we also uh, received, will be receiving another $7 million through the bipart bipartisan infrastructure law funding or bill funding. Um, and that the four priorities that uh, we're working on in that through that program are aquatic organism passage. So that's improving culverts, upgrading culverts. Um, and also removing dams across the U.S. portion of the basin, 
um, land acquisition program. This is to identify parcels of land across the basin, the US, this is all US part of the basin, this, the bill funding, um, that uh, identify parcels of land that are uh, important for uh, water quality or habitat, aquatic habitat conservation. Um, and then uh, we also, we, we issued two years ago, or I guess a year ago now with, with funding from two years ago, we issued an RFP for uh, tree nurseries to augment their number of stems they had available for conservation plantings. Um, we had an overwhelming response for that, way, way more, much stronger response than we were anticipating. We had, um, I think we had $750,000 available for that RFP. We had, I think, close to $2 million in requests, and the steering committee reallocated some funding to support something closer to one and a quarter million dollars. So I have another million dollars in the budget for that program again, and then 500000 for aquatic, for aquatic invasive species management. Um, uh, projects and and uh, implementation programs. Um, thriving communities, we have uh, a lot of money set aside. So we have uh, a little over $3 million in this, in this part of the budget. A lot of it is for organizational support and capacity build, building programs that are run by the Basin Program, Vermont DEC and New York DEC. New York, uh, Vermont DEC will also be doing asset management, um, work for wastewater treatment facilities and, and MS4 stormwater permit funding. And um, we are going to continue the Basin Program's new Disadvantaged Community Liaison Grant Program. That is a, that's a program that we funded last year. Um, that RFP for that first round of funding just closed last week. Um, and the idea there is to uh, award funding to groups working in the Basin and, and who can um, then use those funds to hire or support either a part-time or a new uh, full-time staff position whose role is to work with uh, communities with disadvantages in their geography of interest, wherever that watershed group is or, or other group or is it other group and um, help them identify water quality related projects in their, in those communities and, um, Find help them find ways to get those projects funded, either either through other basin program grants or DEC or 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 whomever, um, as a way to to increase the the implementation rate of water quality projects and ecosystem health projects in in those uh, in those communities. And then finally, in the uh, informed and involved public uh, program, um, we have our our usual suite of outreach grants that'll uh, support about one point three million dollars. We have our uh, we have a whole suite of core projects that that are supported every year one that i th think that would be great to come in if, if we haven't if the, we haven't come in already to talk with you about is the artists and residents program um, that's one that we started a couple of years ago there's been some really interesting uh, uh work that's been supported in that program over the past couple of years and and um i think it'd be great, really neat to to share that with you in, in more detail um also our streamwise and lakewise landowner outreach programs and then um also no, of note is the second would be the second round of our of a public awareness survey that was um, supported three or four years ago now um, and run that one was run by UVM and, and I think Sea Grant and Lake Champlain Committee and, and a couple of other groups. Um, and the idea there is to um, help under, to understand get an understanding of of uh, how uh, stakeholders, uh, how well stakeholders in the basin understand water quality issues and, and um, ecosystem health issues. And uh, so this would be a, a, another round of, to, of that, that type of a survey. Uh, the, the main results from that first round, um, there, was a, there was a lot, but uh, two highlights that I remembered uh, that kind of stand out with me is that um, respondents to the survey, and this was a basin-wide survey, included um, uh, Quebec as well in this one. Uh, the, the results found that respondents feel it's important to take steps to protect the lake. Generally speaking, they understand what some of those steps are, um, but are not actually all that great about taking those steps themselves. So uh, that was an interesting piece of information that we got out of that survey oh, and a lot more. And again, if, if you want to hear more about that, um, Ryan can come in and you know, he may have come in already with, to this, and spoken to this group about it. But um, yeah, that's that was a lot. Um, 
happy to share more at a future date and you can take a, qu a few questions now if you'd like. I'll also just plug um, our release. We our release for the uh, a launch for the next State of the Lake report. We have that scheduled for June 5th. Katie can circulate the details for you. It will be um, at the Grand, uh, Basin Program Office in Grand Isle, 11 a.m. on, on uh, June 5th. Um, we'll have hard copies available and um, the new report will be up on the website too for those of you who can't make it up there. Thanks. Eric, and um, since you'll all probably be at the office for our June 13th retreat, uh, you can grab a hard copy then too, if you can't make it up. Yes, time. you'll see the <laughs> stacks of reports that'll, that'll be piled up around the conference room. Any questions for Eric? Breck? Hey, Eric, um, <clears throat> uh, great to see you. Uh, the, you know, it, it's uh, clear that you need to get, this is a question about the metrics position. And mm -hmm. in particular, um, I understand the, the need for you to collect metrics on how you're using the funds, but specifically in the arena of quantifying phosphorus reductions and so forth, how is that coordinated with what the state's responsibilities are for doing exactly the same thing so that- yep we don't come up with two different estimates. Um, yes, uh, yeah, great question. Um, and uh, that is definitely something that we've been talking with um, Vermont in particular about because Vermont DC has already spent a lot of time and, and resources in developing their tracking program. Um, so we want, we're, we're going to make sure that, that uh, the reporting is, is, is um, done in a way that we aren't double counting uh, phosphorus credits, for example, but each funding source, Basin Program or Vermont DEC, can also take credit for the work that they're supporting. Um, we haven't come, found a, a, a solution for that, but we all are, understand that that's the, that's the goal, um, ultimately. And and, uh, and yeah, so yeah, we are we are definitely so that, that coordination is happening. Yeah. Yep. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Are there any other questions for Eric at this time? Really appreciate you coming and um, presenting all sure. of that. It's a yeah. tremendous amount of work. I, I love seeing that graph of the money and like yeah. where we started and where we are now. So just really kudos to anybody and everybody who's been able to um, get that funding to start with and then also maintain and sustain it over the years. So. Yeah, well, since and since I actually have, um, I've been working on something else, and, and the, the, I so I've been looking back at um, the full history of funding for the Basin Program, and our our first round of funding, pot of funding, or, or, or I should say, our first federal appropriation was in 1991, and that was just shy of 1.4 million dollars. So we've yeah we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no uh, better thing to invest in than our water. So I really appreciate it and all the work that you all do. Um, as chair of the committee this year, I've been privileged to sit at all the steering and executive committee meetings. And um, it is really incredible how you all keep it together and all the information that you present and the feedback that you take. So just really kudos to the team at the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, the process is really um, incredible. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Welcome. Katie, I think we have one more. Am I wrong? 607. Are we on time? We're a little behind, but I am presenting next. So uh, I can always catch you guys up on this uh, if, if we have to cut some slides. But biosphere in your backyard. Yes. Um, before I dive into that, um, I did just want to post this article in the chat about um, the Champlain Hudson Power Express uh, cables that will be installed this summer since that was our original agenda item, which unfortunately they have uh, needed to reschedule, but um, just wanted to um, share this. I, I saw this article today and at least you can have some sort of written update if we're not going to get the formal presentation today um, that 
will likely be rescheduled outside of one of our um, regular meetings and will just be a public informational meeting um, for both of the CACs and any other interested parties in the public. So I'm working to get that rescheduled, but that work will be underway starting in June. Um, so are we are we thinking it would be outside of our regular CAC and maybe do it in combination with the, is that what you just said? In yeah, combination yeah. With the CACs, the Quebec and the New York one? Yep. That would be awesome. Okay. Okay, but it won't be like a schedule, like one of our Monday night meetings, like we tried to do for this one. No, because yeah, and I know we ended up on a Wednesday anyway. So uh, thank you all for your <laughs> flexibility with the scheduling on this one. Um, yeah, I think because we have the retreat in July that shifts our schedule anyway. And um, the New York CDC yeah. also does their little um, in-person gathering as well later in the month. So we'll probably... I, and I'm gone the first week of June, so we'll figure out a good date for it. Um, I don't have to get into all of the scheduling details now, but I am working to get that rescheduled because I think it's an important topic that um, we need to share broadly. Yeah, our, our retreats in June, so maybe July would be the time to look at that meeting, right? Am I getting yeah, I mean, the, the installation starts in June, so I guess it just depends on when folks want that information. which I would, I would be open to that feedback uh, now if you have uh, preferences, but you can think about that, put it in the chat, we can revisit that later, um, but would be helpful to know as I get back in touch with them. And I'm just gonna pull up my present. Oh, Denise, go ahead. No, that's it. I was just gonna say thank you, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see. So I won't be able to see you all once I start sharing my screen. So if you have, um, let's save the questions for the end, maybe so I can monitor hand raises and stuff, um, but we'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, okay, yeah, I shared the screen. Okay, all right, you all seeing my title slide? Yes. Okay, great. I was like, I can't see anyone. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, so I think the last time we spoke to you all about the biosphere was back in 2021. So there's been some good progress since then. Um, if I know a couple of you have been to the CV and HP summit, so some of this new information might be um, uh, repetitive to some, but um, there's there's some updates beyond that as well. So. Uh, as you know, uh, my the other part of my role with the Basin Program is supporting the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Network um, as the coordinator in addition to coordinating the CACs. Um, so when I'm not working with you all, this is what I'm spending my time doing. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the Biosphere in Your Backyard campaign that we're doing this year. Uh, but before uh, we start with those details, I wanna just touch on the concept of bioregionalism. Uh, as that's really central to um, biosphere regions, uh, the goal of uh, these UNESCO designated sites and, and how they operate. So bioregionalism transcends boundaries and it shifts the focus beyond political boundaries to instead focus on our shared uh, um, ecology, landscapes, waters, and cultural identity. And it's really a vision of the future that works for both people and the environment. And a major focus of bioregionalism is to empower residents and communities to participate in the management and protection of their shared natural resources, which is something that you all are very familiar with being on the CAC. Um, so the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Network is part of UNESCO's Man in the Biosphere program. So this was launched in 1971 by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Uh, and it's a science-based program that aims to promote a balanced relationship between humans and the environment. Uh, it's voluntary and cooperative, so biosphere regions are under the sovereign jurisdiction of their home countries, states, and local jurisdictions. There's no regulatory authority that comes with this um, recognition. Uh, there are 748 biosphere regions in the World Network of Biosphere Reserves in 134 countries currently. Um, including 22 transboundary biosphere regions. A quick vocabulary note, I've already switched between biosphere regions and biosphere reserves. 
Uh, in 2020, the U.S. Biosphere Network adopted the term biosphere region uh, instead of reserve. Uh, we don't have enough time to get into the reasons for that now, but happy to catch you up at the retreat. Uh, outside of the U.S., though, the term biosphere reserve is still used. So functionally, biosphere region and biosphere reserve are referring to the same thing. Biosphere regions are... Uh, important because they're learning places for sustainable development. Uh, the Man in the Biosphere program aims to enhance the relationship between people and the environment by playing a key role in achieving the sustainable development goals, um, which I'll pop up on the next slide. There are three functions of a biosphere region that are depicted in that graphic on the left, uh, conservation of biodiversity and cultural diversity, economic development that is socioculturally and environmentally sustainable, uh, and logistic support underpinning development through research, monitoring, education, and training. And around the world, uh, communities and organizations really build on this recognition to advance economic development and conservation. So central to strategic objectives of the Man in the Biosphere program, um, as well as the mission, vision, and value of the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Network cabin are these 17 sustainable development goals. Biosphere regions can play a key role in achieving the sustainable development goals by implementing local solutions to global problems through uh, innovative approaches to conservation and sustainable development. So the boxes that are outlined in black here um, are the sustainable development goals that uh, CABIN's current partners are working on uh, most frequently, but uh, you know, there's work happening related to all 17 sustainable development goals within our biosphere region. Bringing us back down from the broader program to our own uh, Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Region, the biosphere in our backyard. Um, Want to zoom in on a couple of the highlights here. So we received our designation in 1989, which is two years before the Basin Program was established. Um, uh, the boundaries consist of the uh, wilderness portions of the Green Mountains. Uh, the whole Adirondack Park, the New York and Vermont portions of the Lake Champlain watershed, and really important here is all of the working landscapes in between. So that's an important distinction of a biosphere region versus a traditional protected area is it includes a core protected area, but also includes the peopled landscape around it. We're at just under 10 million acres. Um, another vocabulary distinction I'm going to bring up here. Uh, so we use the term biosphere region when we're referring to the geography of the area. So, um, you know, the Adirondacks, the Green Mountains, and the um, Lake Champlain watershed, we use the term biosphere network when referring to the collaborative of partners who are working across this biosphere region to fulfill the goals of um, our biosphere region and the Man in the Biosphere program. Uh, CABIN is governed by a 12-person steering committee, uh, as well as a growing youth board. We have representation from New York and Vermont. Uh, Kelly Siriallo from Paul Smith College, and uh, she's also the coordinator of the U.S. Biosphere Network, and Jim Brangan um, from LCBP, who you all know, co-chaired the steering committee currently, um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, am staff support. Uh, CABIN is currently housed within the Basin Program, which allows me to work on this and also uh, has allowed us to uh, sort of infiltrate into the latest edition of Opportunities for Action, uh, which has been wonderful because that's opened a new avenue for funding for projects related to the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Network. And there's a big overlap between the goals of CABIN um, and the Basin Program, but there's also some unique distinction and uh, some more focus on uh, climate action through the biosphere network. Uh, we've had this international recognition for a really long time and not many people know about it. Uh, so it's an interesting place to be in my role, um, trying to uh, build excitement and energy around something that has existed for a while and, and bring people into that at this stage. But uh, we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of years, uh, and especially with the partnerships and projects through uh, the CBNHP funding that I'll cover a little bit later. Um, we have lots of new cabin ambassadors as well and are looking forward to continuing to make progress. 
Uh, some more details about CABIN's mission and vision. So we seek to serve as a collaborative network within our biosphere region that empowers citizens to build a thriving, equitable, and resilient society that conserves biological diversity and promotes sustainable uses of natural resources in the face of a warming climate and other environmental changes. Uh, and similar to the vision of many other organizations um, in this region, we work to inspire a positive future for our region by celebrating and connecting people in nature. An important distinction since there is a, I'm a little bit ahead on my presenter view, but there's the vision and the value that CABIN brings. Uh, we seek to serve as a connector and convener of community, national and international partners that are working on related issues relevant to building a sustainable future. So uh, we really aim to elevate and celebrate the work that's being done across our region uh, rather than uh, be another duplicative endeavor. So just working to celebrate that work that's already happening and making sure partners across our region are in contact with one another and can collaborate on this good work. Um, and we also have a strong connection to the U.S. Biosphere Network as well as the World Network of Biosphere Reserves. Um, so that this slide sort of demonstrates the nested networks of biosphere regions. So inherent in our designation is connection to a national and global network of communities and organizations working on sustainable development goals. Uh, so we are part of that world network, which has 748 sites currently. Uh, we're also part of the world network of mountain biosphere reserves. There are over 450 uh, biosphere reserves that are found in mountainous regions. Uh, the U.S. Biosphere Network contains 28 biosphere regions. Um, part of my role, I sit on, uh, I chair the U.S. Biosphere Network's Communications Committee, so it's great that we have uh, a couple of direct tie-ins to the larger U.S. network as well. Um, and then, of course, CABIN works across regional partnerships and collaboratives. And being part of this series of nested networks is a unique strength of our status as a biosphere region, and it gives us a uh, great opportunity to learn from others' successes and failures, as well as share our lessons learned and best practices. And my favorite part of this is it's a way that we can bring local initiatives to a global stage and really serve as an example for other biosphere regions within these broader networks. So these are the three to five year objectives that were developed in 2019. I'll just um, speak about the, the top three here. Um, the main issue we focus on is developing a bioregional approach for our region in the face of global climate change. Uh, we seek to inspire and empower youth leaders across the region to support sustainable development goals. Um, UNESCO has a broad definition of youth from 18 to 35, so targeting um, you know, high school students, uh, college students, and also young professionals. Uh, and we uh, are working to establish CABIN as a collaborative network, both regionally and internationally, and we've done a lot of great work on that front. Uh, these are some 2023 highlights. I can share the um, uh, annual report that has these numbers, so you can have access to that later. Um, and just to touch on some of these uh, various pieces, I want to talk about the Atlas of Climate and Environmental Change that was started by Emmanuel Carter, who is a professor at uh, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and he's also a member of the Cabin Steering Committee. Um, this project is a really wonderful example of a project that not only advances Cabin's goals, but um, also, and the goals of the Man in the Biosphere program, uh, but really illustrates our connection to those various networks um, that I showed on uh, the previous slide. Uh, so he developed this idea to for a climate atlas that would serve as a tool for climate informed decision making and place based data literacy in the Champlain Adirondack and the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network. Um, we have a twinning agreement with the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network in Canada. We're co-located on the Frontenac axis and have a lot of um, similar issues that we're trying to, to address. So we've been working with them to advance um, different uh, technological innovations and partnerships. And this project is one of one example of that. Uh, so they're using data compiled from SUNY ESF's biological station and the Queen's University Biological Field Station, and the goal is to create an open access integrative transboundary framework uh, that can be used to analyze and disseminate climate and environmental change data uh, that is relevant to both decision making and education. 
So it was funded first um, through a North American Partnership for Environmental Commun Community Action Grant uh, that the U.S. Biosphere Network uh, and the Canadian Biosphere Reserves Association received. Um, so that was last summer this work uh, got underway. Uh, so Sarah Constantino, who was a graduate student at SUNY ESF, worked with Emmanuel and uh, Dr. Dan Cronin, who's another professor at SUNY ESF, uh, to start work on the Atlas. Um, and they met with partners across both biosphere regions to inform the scope of the project, the data that would be needed, and to better understand how the Atlas might be used. So after uh, that progress, from that first round of funding, um, Cabin submitted a proposal to uh, a UNESCO programs and sites project that was being offered by the Venice office and the Aberdeen Charitable Foundation. So along with four other UNESCO sites in Europe, Cabin was selected to receive funding to continue work on the Atlas. Um, and this was really exciting for us. Uh, Sarah and I both got to go to the launch event in Venice, um, and we were able to share this work on a truly international stage. There were 10 countries represented in the room, uh, and we received a lot of great feedback on the proposed work and a lot of interest in the scalability of this project to other biosphere regions. Um, so it was great for us to be able to share what we're doing, but it was also inspiring to hear the other projects that were happening in these regions and consider how we might be able to apply that in our own space. Uh, so the work on the Atlas is ongoing right now. Uh, they're planning to have an operational version of the Atlas uh, within the next month or so, I believe. So I can share updates on that um, once that's ready for prime time. Uh, so in addition to that project, I want to highlight our connection to the World Network of Mountain Biosphere Reserves, uh, which we officially joined in 2023. Uh, so pictured here, cabin co-chair um, Kelly Siriallo attended the first workshop of the World Network of Mountain Biosphere Reserves in China, um, along with representatives from other mountain biosphere reserves in 17 countries, and there they laid the groundwork for the network's future contributions to global conservation initiatives. Um, and I'll just highlight, um, I'm going to Germany uh, the first week of June to go to Euromab, which is uh, the biennial conference of the European, U.S., and Canadian biosphere reserves. So that'll be a great opportunity to meet with others and um, share the work we're doing in our region and, again, get some inspiration on uh, different projects we might want to implement. And I think for me, what's really important is learning how um, how those other biosphere reserves are engaging with, with community and not just at the academic level, which I think Cabin has been really strong with, but um, I think we could be better about uh, getting our name and purpose and um, value out at the community level, which is uh, part of the reason that 2024 is the uh, year that the CBNHP has decided to focus on the, um, the biosphere as the conservation and community interpretive theme. Um, so we're focusing on the biosphere in your backyard this year. Uh, there's There are uh, 10 or 11 projects that have been funded uh, through the CBNHP uh, to support cabin specific uh, projects. So we have a whole new team of on the ground ambassadors that are working with communities to undertake projects that can help build a future that works for both people and the environment and increase awareness of this special international designation that we have as a biosphere region and what that means and why it matters. So uh, we've coined this tagline, biosphere in your backyard, to try to help build a stronger sense of place and pride for the people and the environment that we have right here in our backyard. And 2024 marks 35 years since uh, we received this recognition by UNESCO um, and we have all of these great uh, projects funded by CBNHP, so it seems like a really great time to focus in on this campaign. Uh, and the goals of the campaign are to increase awareness of our international status, inspire people to connect responsibly with the unique natural and cultural resources of our region, and promote the projects, programs, and people working towards a sustainable future in our biosphere region. Um, and the three pillars of the campaign, I won't read all the details here, but explore, enrich, and enjoy, which I think are three things that we can all get behind. Um, I want to highlight some of the projects that have been funded through the CBNHP uh, to support the biosphere in your backyard. We have um, 
a subset of projects that will be focused on empowering youth. So the Bixby Library and Vergennes will be partnering with libraries and schools to develop um, some programs that enlighten and empower students and their educators as stewards of our biosphere region. Uh, we'll be continuing work with the Wild Center um, on their Empowering Youth Project, which will increase uh, youth climate education through summits and leadership training in climate science, biodiversity, and sustainability. Uh, and one thing I want to mention about the Wild Center is we often use their uh, climate youth climate summit model uh, as uh, we, we share that internationally with other biosphere regions, and that's now been implemented in at least five other biosphere regions internationally in Canada, in Italy, in South Africa. And um, there's also a group in, uh, I believe, Malaysia that will be putting on a youth climate summit later this year. So we're, that's a great example of a local initiative on a global stage. Uh, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum is hosting a summer camp focused on the history and craft of mining and metal arts in the Champlain Adirondack biosphere. So um, you can see through these projects, there's just a wide array of ways to contribute to the sustainable development goals and highlight connection to nature and culture. So I'm really excited to be supporting these projects. Uh, some examples here, connecting people in nature, uh, future forests we imagined will be working um, on a follow up on a successful webinar series that some cabin steering com committee members were involved with planning and executing. Um, the Maritime Museum has another grant with us to do some on-site uh, and digital programming, connecting people with the resources of the Biosphere region. Um, and the uh, Adirondack Watershed Institute will be continuing uh, their fiber arts work, but specifically doing a community mapping exercise to understand values uh, that people have in the Biosphere region. Uh, this next round of projects is focused on storytelling for a sustainable future, so showcasing agritourism in the biosphere. Uh, Adirondack Watershed Institute will be celebrating Cabin during Adirondack Water Week, um, which is taking place in August. Uh, we'll have a video series about uh, folks who are uh, doing their part for a sustainable future by the Crandall Public Library. Um, and Bixby has another uh, grant with us to engage uh, an intern to make uh, some resources more accessible to the public. So that's those are the CBNHP funded projects. Uh, just a couple more things that we have planned for 2024 and beyond. Um, I won't go over all of these, but I do want to highlight a couple uh, the Capturing Climate Change Phenology Project uh, is something that I'm working on. Uh, we will be partnering with Chronolog, uh, which uh, provides these little 3D printed phone stands and signs. So you mount them to a location. It allows folks to take identically framed photos and submit them online. And they produce time lapses to help show how that area is changing over time and what climate impacts might be to leaf out dates or other things like that. So that's an exciting community science project that uh, will be cabin branded. And so that'll help us get our name out there a little bit more and engage at least uh, 10 partners on the New York and Vermont side of the biosphere region. So really excited to um, get that project started. Um, we also have, uh, the cabin strategic plan to revisit later this year. Those goals were developed in 2019. They were three to five year goals. We're at year five. So we'll be working to update um, our strategic plan and map uh, map cabins vision forward. Uh, and I wanna highlight the transboundary expansion piece right at the end here. So uh, a few weeks ago at the Basin Program Steering Committee meeting, we had a visit by Miriam Boomeran, who is chief of section for the Man in the Biosphere Program's Research and Policy Office um, in the UNESCO Paris office. Uh, she came to our biosphere region for a brief visit, uh, and we had some initial discussions about the potential to expand the boundaries of the biosphere region to include the Quebec portion of the watershed as well. Um, since bioregionalism is such an important focus of uh, biosphere reserves and, and bio, um, 
biosphere regions, uh, it feels a little silly at this stage to not have the Quebec portion included. I think when it was designated originally, transboundary biosphere reserves were not a thing. So we're looking into uh, exploring this potential for transboundary expansion further with partners in, in Canada, as well as New York and Vermont. So that'll be an exciting thing um, to hopefully move forward and discuss. But uh, I am happy to talk about this at any time with any of you. Um, that's the highlight reel. Um, but I'll just end with, we invite you to join us in building a sustainable future together, which you're already doing with your participation on the CAC. So thank you, <laughs> Bob. Oh, wow, there was a lot there. Yeah, um, sorry, I was probably impressive. talking very fast. I apologize. <laughs> no, not in the least. Um, I remember your earlier presentations. I'm just saying, wow, uh, that is really good stuff. And uh, I, I was very impressed with your presentation. I just say at a personal level, and uh, I'm proud to have you represent Vermont in uh, Germany. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say the same thing. Katie, you have been incredible right from the first moment you started with us. Huge, huge, wonderful thing. Thank you. <laughs> That's actually why I put myself on the agenda to receive lots of praise. No, just kidding. Uh, but thank you. It's very kind. <laughs> Lori? Thanks, Katie. Yeah, um, great presentation. And um, just wanted to share a little historical perspective as um, when I was a youth, I was part of the um, lobbying contingent and the organizing group to put um, the, uh, you know, try and advance the application for the Adirondack Biosphere Reserve um, in this region. And a key part at that time, you, you know, you're absolutely correct, Quebec wasn't included in that because that wasn't the focus. And at the time, and back in 1989, when we were putting together the application, which I think happened really started in 1985, around that time, uh, uh, you know, there were very few populated what was then called biosphere reserves. Um, this was um, the proposal for the Lake Champlain region was an aberration. And a lot of the impetus for it was by organizations, agencies, and individuals that were really looking for more coordinated effort, particularly for Lake Champlain, and trying to figure out what would be the avenues for that. And one of the reasons that it um, ended up, uh, you know, not having as much prominence as you know you're reinvigorating it today is because there were we were also working on things like the basin program and for some of us involved in the biosphere reserve the basin program then provided a greater platform for that coordinated effort new york vermont and quebec um, zeroing in on and uh, helping to address the challenges of the day, and it provided more secure funding. So some of the key leaders not abandoned the Biosphere Reserve, but there wasn't at that time an opportunity to integrate it. And so it's really great to see it coming kind of full circle um, and being integrated into the Basin Program. And I think it'll also make over time, uh, you know, an opportunity for greater efficiency of resources, because as you noted in your very good presentation, um, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the, the goals of um, opportunities for action, as well as that larger um, bias for region initiative and the goals there too. Thanks for that perspective, Lori. Uh, Breck, you had your hand up. Do you have a question? I don't see that. I now. didn't have a question. Uh, <laughs> it was a comment, Katie, that I have learned and heard more about Cabin in the years that you, the brief time that you have been the coordinator than in the 20 years prior. And it's just fantastic what you've done. I just wanted to second, third, everything that I, that others said. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. A couple of weeks ago, I gave a presentation to the Shelburne Rotary Club about this. Um, and yeah, it was a, a good test of how you share this, I don't know, UNESCO stuff can be hard to <laughs> explain sometimes. And I think I still have some massaging to do on the presentation. And um, as we, I'm great. really excited about the phenology project to have um, a real 
on the ground project we can point to um, to, you know, say ways to get involved because, yeah, as I mentioned, largely at this stage, it's been very much at the academic level, which has been great, but, um, you know, it's important to get community participation and buy-in into this as well. Thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Well, if any other questions come up, you know where to find me. Um, but I do want to make sure that we uh, have time to talk about the July, uh, not July, June retreat planning. Um, so yeah, the retreat is June 13th from nine to three at the Basin Program Office, uh, not May 21st. That was the original date. If that's still on your calendar, delete it. Don't come to the office. I will not be there, but uh, <laughs> you're you're welcome to come to the office that day, but there will be no meeting. Um, so Denise, I don't know if you had thoughts you wanted to start off with. I have some um, potential agenda items. I can share my screen. Yeah, I think that would be great if you could share your screen. Um, Katie's been bouncing ideas off Karina and I, so. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to look at this on my phone and having challenges. There you go. No, that's okay. It's my fault. Um, yeah, so I think right now what we want to do is just kind of um, connect and figure out what we want to get out of the uh, retreat. And so there's a couple of like brainstorming ideas for what we can talk about. Um, and I think for me, one of the, I think the important things is that we work uh, on the uh, action plan timeline so that we have a similar timeline that we did this year. Um, so we can, again, get out ahead of the legislature. I'd love some feedback on how people thought that went. Um, we did have that November public meeting, I think that was really uh, well attended. Thank you, everybody, uh, Lori specifically, who got the information, who got the details of that out and really got a great crowd of people to the sailing center that night and um, to the whole basin program staff who made food for it. Um, <laughs> guys are good at that. Um, so I think that the question is, is, you know, are we, do we want to continue on that same timeline? Um, the other piece that we did I think last I, the last few retreats that I can remember is we've talked about the legislative session wrap up. Um, so we try to do this pretty close to after the session ends. Um, uh, really kind of updates on any uh, bills that were passed or that might have stayed on the wall, um, and what are what what could be reflected in our action plan for next year. Lori. Uh, yeah, just a quick question if and I can't I don't know if this is the full sheet, Katie, but I thought we had already agreed that we were going to do another public meeting in the fall and that we would do it um, focused on the state of the lake report because it was coming out in June and that seemed a good topic. And if we choose a topic soon, we can do the advanced publicity, uh, which last year, you know, uh, we we didn't have a lot, uh, a, a long runway, but you know, decided that you know we'd go forward with it anyway. Um, another key part of that that I, you know, helped with the attendance is that we did it in partnership with other organizations, and so I think that's also a good way. You know, that's how, frankly, we got attendees. And then I don't know it, it, the informational presentations. I thought we also discussed at the previous meeting, uh, one of our previous meetings, um, the um, chloride. I, yeah, so you've got that there because because I know May Kate and Matt are working on a report and had noted that they would be happy to give that as part of the presentation um, for our retreat. Um, and I'm personally biased on that because the Lake Champlain Committee is trying to advance legislation um, and that will be something that comes forward um, next session. So just wanted to check in on those and mention that further. Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, so the way that this document is laid out, um, I went by, well, so uh, yeah, I'll start at the top. So um, last year at the retreat, we went over some 
uh, discussion about potential priorities for the basin programs, um, uh, technical research priorities. Uh, Matt and the uh, technical advisory committee will be soliciting feedback on uh, potential priorities again. Those will be due in August. So I would recommend that we set aside some time on the agenda to discuss that. And in addition to the priorities, maybe we can brainstorm some ways that um, the basin program might better get the word out about it since one of the CAC um, recommended priorities that made it on the list, the uh, recreation access didn't receive any applicants um, through the that RFP track. So it would be great if, um, if we could see some applicants come in on that topic this year. Uh, like Denise said, the legislative session wrap up, um, I put the action plan timeline that we've previously discussed here, um, that November meeting um, is on there. Uh, you've made a great point about the power of partnerships and getting attendance to this. Um, I'll note that I reached out to um, the Vermont Federation of Lakes and Ponds uh, to start connecting with them about possible opportunities for collaboration in addition to getting the word out about the action plan, we're trying to see what potential opportunities there might be to um, coordinate with other uh, watershed groups that don't have a seat at this table already um, on action plan priorities and different initiatives we might be able to uh, amplify together through the CAC action plan and whatever additional advocacy um, these other groups are involved in. So uh, we've started those conversations. Um, and I think asking uh, those new partners to spread the word about the action plan rollout meeting would, would make a lot of sense. Um, in terms of State of the Lake being the focus, I have floated that by Basin Program staff and we have another meeting next week and um, I will more firmly make the request for, for the November presentation. Um, I know the last State of the Lake release, we did do some public presentations um, and I think doing it in this format would work really well. Uh, so I broke down the potent, these are not, these are not, they're, one of these is confirmed and you'll see that under AIS spread prevention. Um, but these are just potential topics, uh, based on previous meeting summaries and discussions that, um, uh, as well as questions we received, uh, from the legislature during the presentation. So I wanted to get folks feedback on where the priorities might be, the priority needs for the informational presentations. Um, we won't have a lot of time for um, many long presentations. So just getting a sense of what questions might still need to be answered to better strengthen the action plan requests um, would be helpful. So I'll bold the Matt and Make Hate Road Salt report. Um, I wasn't sure if there were any other Road salt initiatives, Lori, that would be helpful um, to get updates on uh, reaching out to the New Hampshire Green Snow Pro certification folks or the Adirondack Action Clean Water Safe Roads programs, for examples of other programs, or if that, that wouldn't be necessary if those are already folded into um, what you all are doing with that legislation. So wasn't sure which direction we were going in, so it was good to get that reminder about May, Kate, and Matt. Um, but I'll stop talking for a minute and see if folks have thoughts on priority informational presentations or knowledge gaps that you need filled for the action plan. And I'm, I'll, I can paste these into the chat too, that might help. Um, it's hard to get these on one. Breck? Kitty, I, I guess I'm kind of looking at um, on the 13th, we're to review and reassess the 2024 priorities. Is it, uh, will somebody review the substantive actions that were taken on each of those priorities? Should there, should there be break, brief presentations on what was substantively done towards each of those priorities, or is that what happens during the legislative wrap-up? That is the goal of the legislative wrap-up. Okay, okay. Thanks. But if there are items that you think we should have additional speakers on or anything, um, happy to do outreach for those presentations. Well, it just seems logical to me that, you know, kind of review what were the priorities last time, 
what was the progress made towards that? And then what, what are the new things that need to be addressed? This logical progression. Katie, I, this looks great. I'm just like wondering about time and <clears throat> all of these good items and just as far as, are we trying to fit all of these? Or are we trying no. well today to try and prioritize like how many do you think we can squeeze into the day, I guess? Yeah, so the, the meeting is from nine to three. Um, I, it depends, like last year, Meg just gave a 15 minute aquatic invasive species update. So uh, I think it will depend on how deep of a presentation we think we might need. Um, the one that I, I didn't mention this uh, more specifically, but the one that I have confirmed so far is with New York State DEC um, to present about the Adirondack invasive species inspection certification, since that has been, um, the, you know, on the action plan is potentially exploring a similar requirement in Vermont. So hearing how it's going from New York seemed like it would be a, a good presentation to have. Um, but for example, I don't think we're going to need more than 15 minutes on that particular topic. So we could potentially do a, you know, sampler of a lot of short things. I think one thing to consider with the new timeline is we don't have quite as long um, or quite as many additional meetings to have these informational presentations, which um, I think is why we want to try to prioritize uh, the missing pieces um, to focus on at the um, retreat. Breck? Just with that in mind, Katie, have you traditionally done this research priorities uh, part of the agenda up front? Um, last year, I think it was, it was definitely before lunch. Um, and this, yeah, this is not necessarily the order of the agenda. This was just, um, okay. So wow. maybe this is down in the weeds a little bit, but, yeah. you know, having been a long time member and, and chair of the technical advisory committee, I mean, this can, we can get really wrapped yeah. up in the research priorities. And I just wonder about being sure that we get kind of the, the, well, it's all important, but I'd recommend maybe that being later in the day, maybe the end of the day. We're going to be tired by that point, but I think it seems that that getting the legislative update and deciding on the action plan and deciding about the missing pieces sound like the priorities, yeah. and that whatever energy we've got left is is kind of on what might be missing with respect to research pieces, and that would have been informed by these presentations, these informal presentations. That That's a got. great point. Wayne? Yeah, Katie, I have a topic I just wanted to float by everybody. I kind of on the fence about whether this, this is really a statewide issue. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be addressed after I retire. But um, And I know you've, I'm dealing with this in my professional life on a pretty regular basis. And it you know, starts with the PFAS. And it has to do with the municipal wastewater facilities, um, you know, the septage and the sludge management. It's really a statewide issue. Uh, the beneficial reuse is pretty much ended. You know, the land application of those materials because of the risk and concern about PFAS and the liability. Um, it's got to go somewhere. And my two cents is that the state really needs to take the lead on this issue. Um, two years back, for example, I had a 50% grant program to help fund capital improvements to kind of better manage the septage and the biosolids. And then beyond that, it's really got to be a region, you know, stepping down from the state, there's got to be some kind of regional structure. It's got to, to me, volume reduction is the absolute kind of solution moving forward. We can't, you know, afford to bury it in landfills. Canada's, Quebec's not taking it any longer. Um, some of it's going to New Hampshire, some of it's going um, over to New York. Um, so I feel like it's got to be really addressed at a regional issue. So there's got to be a facility in Bron in the Chittenden County area. There's got to be one in Franklin County. There's got to be one in Rutland County. So I'll just kind of put that out there. That's a pretty major issue. You know, it's got a lot of 
primary and secondary issues, everything from cost to water quality to we need to find better ways to management. And there's a lot of these technologies are relatively new and not very mature, but you know, it's really the state needs to really take the lead. And like I said, beyond that, it's gonna be a regional partnership, you know, in a lot of these different communities. So I just kind of put that out there. That's a pretty major issue right now. And again, I'm not sure if that follows you know, our charge here, it's obviously got water quality effects. I'm um, not sure if that's something we want to take on, should be part of the action plan, but um, that is a major kind of statewide issue at the moment. I'll let Bob follow up. Well, I know okay. Bob's good. He supports that. I know he has to do on a day-to-day -day basis, so. Yeah, I'd like to oppose Wayne on anything. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, uh, yeah, I completely support that. Um, yeah, the, the main issue is with the new CERCLA designation coming out uh, at the national level, especially uh, septage is is um, concentrated uh, with P. You know, there's PFAS issues on everything, and even with the new with the current guidance from EPA on sec, you know, on secondary users. Um, nonetheless, it's, it's a huge issue. I have to. I have to agree with Wayne. Uh, we have the most sep uh, septic tanks per population in the United States. So yes, thank you, Wayne. Uh, Wayne, I'm curious what what sort of presentation you might be looking for if you have thoughts on who could speak to the issue. Well, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Bob and I have enough <clears throat> background on it to probably educate people. Again, I'm not sure if that's a topic that should be for this group. I guess that's probably the first discussion I had, Katie. Um, again, it's got some effects as far as what we do, but it's really a statewide issue. Um, so I think that's probably the first point of discussion here. I mean, if people in agreement with that, we can really drill into the details more. But okay. like, for example, I was in Springfield today. I know they're not in the Champlain Basin, but they've composted for 30 years. and. They just shut that down here in the last few weeks. Uh, they couldn't get rid of that product, you know, they were public anymore because it's a liability if there is PFOS and other than PFOS in it. And, um, you know, all of a sudden you're taking the responsibility of where it's used potentially in the future. And, you know, it's going to New Hampshire and, you know, there's not any real beneficial reuse. It's not really helping us from a water quality standpoint and to find a better way to manage it. So, Anyway, so first question is whether that's anything this group is that could fit into the, the action plan. Um, and then after that, we can drill in at more of the details of it. But it's a real major statewide issue. Um, and it's it's a significant cost. I mean, for example, <clears throat> we work a lot of these lagoon wastewater facilities and we have to do a sludge clean out. And, you know, Hinesburg is probably going to spend towards a three million dollars um you know before they get done but so it still a lot of kind of main issues with that but it's all part of what we do and um, we need to manage a lot properly right i like i'd like to agree with that but uh you know i'm not i also agree with wayne i'm not saying this has necessarily turned out the action plan or that this, this is more just probably informational for the group but this is a huge topic actually so uh, yes, I, I I agree with Wayne one hundred percent. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, I I just want to second or third that I think this is an important topic worth knowing about. That. I I think that there's a related piece to to this as well, and that is there is a a huge push around housing and and what we're going to do with housing, the missing middle ground middle housing uh, concept and people adding ADUs and develop, you know, we, we need to develop new housing. What, how does that intersect, not only with the wastewater treatment facility capacity that we have and how we're gonna deal with that, but in stormwater management and so forth, everyone is gonna have to have their permits clearly and, and they will have to uh, abide by the rules and regulations. But have we, you know, is there research that is needed about, um, what it is we're facing with respect to this new housing push that we're likely to see and our capacity to deal with that with respect to protecting the lake.
It's a great question, Breck. I think about it all the time. And I think that um, yeah, I it, it's it's uh it's a you know it, it's 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 complicated. It's it's just so much because it's like we we need and every time you build a house, you're building impervious surface, right? And so like, and you're contributing more to the, the waste and the, and the wastewater systems. Um, yeah. And I think Bob has lots of thoughts about septage um, and whether or not we should even allow people to have septic systems. Um, and well, I that was somewhat, remember, as a personal person, not me and, and affiliated with anyone. That was a personalized and also, you know, for the future good, but nonetheless, right. That is, you know, I, the extreme view, I'm just giving the, you know, the, the counterpoint here more or less, but nonetheless, right. I did my first house was in Lake Tahoe and TRPA Tahoe regional planning had extremely stick re strip uh, regulations on everything. And I'm just saying it was because it was a pristine area. And so was Vermont. That's all I have to say. And it was as a person, Bob Fisher, very resident. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Brock. Uh, thanks. Uh, there is a bill that passed uh, this session that was a combination of a housing bill and a an Act 250 bill for all intents and purposes. It's H-687. You might want to take a look at that, all 176 pages of it. And that bill purports to deal with uh, the housing crisis and our need to add housing and where to put it, but also combining that with the environmental needs uh, in order to support that increased housing. And it's not that there's a massive increase of housing. There's a the bill is extremely complicated and and, and the like, but it uh, takes into account the needs for uh, environmental protection at the same time that housing is being created and also where it's being placed. And uh, I think we should take a look at that. Uh, if, you, if you have questions, there is a summary of the bill that, that we can provide you that perhaps uh, cuts through some of the, the, the detail, but uh, I, I think you'll find that those things were taken into consideration uh, quite seriously during the course of the session. Thanks. Um, okay, so recognizing that we have one minute left, or I guess it's seven now, um, I don't want to keep folks on too long, but maybe, um, yeah, just think about these items. If there's anything you feel strongly about that um, we should uh, try to have an informational presentation on, uh, please let me know. I might, maybe I'll send something out that folks can rank topics or something. I'll, I'll think of a creative way that we can get this feedback, but I, some of it will depend on speaker availability. So um, that's always a factor, but uh, Wayne, was that a fresh hand? Yeah, just very quick. Um, yeah. So I, I could totally agree, at least the new construction, um, you know, I would say I'm probably not as concerned about the impacts of that new impervious area. You know, for example, I live pretty close to Market Street, South Burlington. At least all that new construction has to comply with the current regulatory requirements. You know, so we're getting state of the art, you know, sufficient stormwater treatment. I would probably put a little different spin on that. I, I'm probably more concerned about the existing hardscape and previous area amenities. And that's the way we can, I think, have a bigger, better <laughs> impact on, you know, water quality and you're getting into the three acre rule. I think that's probably more critical at the moment, um, just because of the scale, the extent of that with schools, the U Mall, for example, and a lot of these places just don't have sufficient adequate stormwater treatment systems. And there's a heavy lift there. There's a huge need, not probably enough funding and everything, that, and that's going to take some time. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll keep digging into this a little bit by email, and um, I'll uh, start doing some outreach on um, filling in those informational presentation um, spots on the agenda. Um, Denise, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to add at this time on this topic. No, sorry, my phone died. You're um, fine. But yeah, 
I have to go to. So. Um, I did just want to ask for folks who submitted um, uh, the per diem reimbursements from the first round, so um, not the most recent set that was due in April, but before that, has anyone received their payment yet? No, okay. I will let um, Mary know. Okay, well, I think that's it. We'll see you on June 13th, um, hopefully in person, but there will be a virtual sign in if you need it. Thank you. I'm excited for in person. I hate Teams and Zoom so much at this point in my life. I look so done with it. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Katie. Bye. Thanks, Katie.